And so in just a few minutes this morning, I want to look at each of these three components to our commission. And I want to provide one specific challenge that comes in this new world, this new digital world. I don't want us to be afraid of what's happening. I don't want us to be afraid of all these new technologies we have, but I do want us to be aware. I want us to be thinking about them and realize that as much as the the Lord loves technology, as much as the Lord will use these things, we do have an opponent who will try to use them for his purposes as well. So the first part, the most foundational part of the Great Commission is to go. I cannot carry out the Great Commission on my couch, right? I can't carry it out in my home. I need to go. That's the very first, the, very, the most foundational thing of all. I need to go. Why do I need to go? Well, because in order to share that gospel message, I have to go where the people are who haven't yet heard it. I have to go where the people are who haven't yet received it. And so Jesus told his disciples, he said, go and make disciples of all nations. What did that mean for them? That meant they started in Jerusalem. And then they expanded out to Judea and then to Samaria, and then to all the earth, right? So they began in their city, and then in their region, and then in their country, and then they went out to all the world. What did that command mean in the age of the the great missionaries? Well, it meant most of them were British or American, mostly British. It meant they started there in the British Isles, and they expanded out across the continent, and then expanded to new continents, and soon they reached all the world. It was a commission for them to go, to leave behind everything they knew, to leave behind every comfort and to go far and to take the gospel message with them. And we still sing as a church a lot of those old mission hymns. And you can often pick up that thread of the, the colonial feel to them. They're leaving the islands and they're going out to the heathen lands and they're taking the gospel to these places where the gospel had never in all of human history been proclaimed. What does it mean to go today? What does it mean to go in a digital world? But we still acknowledge, of course, that we need to go. We need to go somewhere, somehow, in order to share the gospel. But today, many, many people believe, and this may be particularly true among the younger generation, they believe that they can go even while they stay right at home. They believe they can go while they're sitting in front of their computer using a keyboard. Let me explain. The Internet has done something very, very interesting, very unexpected to us. You know, we refer to the internet as cyberspace, right? You've heard that term, cyberspace. Notice the word space in there. Somehow the internet gives us the impression, the idea that if you and I are both using the same website at the same time, that somehow we're actually there. We're actually there together. You can probably identify with that. Computers somehow, we feel like they transport us to this place where we now exist together where we can now have true fellowship and true community out there somewhere. Even though physically you're at your keyboard here in the Atlanta area, I'm at my my keyboard at home in the Toronto area, we're accessing the same site at the same time. We feel like we're there, like enough of us, enough of who we really are has been transported online that we're now there. We've actually gone somewhere together. This has never happened before in human history. We've had lots of other technological advancements, Right? When you watched your TV and I watched my TV, we never imagined that we were together in cable land or something, right? That, that never occurred to us. When you read a book and I read a book, we could read the same book at the same time. We never imagined that we were now together somewhere. And yet through the internet, when we're using our devices together, we actually feel like we're together, like we're in a genuine kind of community. And this is why the, the, we've seen a rise in cyber churches today and churches that exist only on the internet or largely on the internet, where I can sit in front of my screen and watch a pastor preaching and feel like I'm there in church with you, right? This has given rise to the sense that I can actually be where I am on the web. This has done something very interesting to us. For a lot of people now, and again, this is primarily in the younger demographic, a lot of people, their sense of belonging, their sense of identity is now unhinged from geography. Right? It used to be that your identity was found in local community, in local family, in local church, neighborhood, tribe, clan, whatever it was. Your, your main identity was geographic, right? I belonged here where I am. Well, it shouldn't surprise us then that as communities grow up online, people refer to them as communities, as fellowships, as tribes, as clans. People are replacing what they had here 
with what exists online. And now that's where people are finding their identity. A lot of people would identify with a group of people online far closer than they would identify with people in the same geographic context. And that's because people are spending a lot more time online than offline now. And so community and identity, they're now based on shared interest as much, maybe more so, than on shared space, shared geography. And if that's not you, then it might be your children. It'll definitely be more of a temptation for your grandchildren. This is really growing up around us now. So there's this huge shift now where people are sitting by themselves, sitting by themselves in a dark room and going online through their computer in order to find fellowship, in order to find community. Do you understand what a massive shift that is, how this is completely unparalleled? Well, this gives us new opportunities. It's not all bad, right? Being able to go online, being able to find community online, it's not entirely bad. It gives us abilities we wouldn't have otherwise had. God has made us so we all have very different interests, right? What interests you may not interest me. What interests me may not interest you. And it's great. That's the way the Lord has made us. And, And through the internet, we can find people who share our interests, And so I can go, if I'm into stamp collecting, I can go online and I can find a whole community of people who are passionate about that and I can enjoy communicating with them. I can enjoy fellowship. If if you're into knitting, then you can go and you can find knitting blogs and you can communicate there. And I have a friend who does that very thing. She goes online and she communicates about knitting. And it's well and good. As communities form online, we as Christians have the opportunity to participate in them and to be Christians there, to speak as Christians there, maybe even eventually to speak the gospel there. This is, this is well and good. But there is a concern, and there is a challenge for us here, in that the gospel is preached most powerfully when it's preached through authentic, real-world relationship, right? We all know this. To preach the gospel most powerfully, you preach it where you have authentic relationship, authentic friendship. So part of our commission to go, it's tied up in the, great, the second great commandment, to love your neighbor as yourself, right? We, the, the call to go, that's a call to go and love. The call to go is a call to go and to serve. So we go to love. We go to love and we trust that when we love people, when we serve people, that then opens up doors for us to speak the gospel to them. And we trust that when those doors are open and we speak the gospel, that the Lord will work and he will save his people. We can love best, and we can love most naturally, and therefore we can speak best, and we can speak most powerfully when we are fully actually present there in the real world. Of course, we know this. I can love the person next door to me in a far more significant, a far more powerful way than I can love the person who lives in the next county, or the person who lives in the next country, or the person who lives halfway across the world, right? The basis of our commission is go. That means we need to go and be present in the real world. We need to be focusing on friendships and relationships here in the real world. It means I need to be loving the people who are closest to me more, more often, more significantly than the people who are very far away from me. It means my primary responsibility before the Lord is to share the gospel with the people who are right around me. I I have no right before the Lord to ignore the people closest to me and share the gospel with others. I've got to build outward. So we have this challenge. We need to continue to build real-world relationships. We need to continue to value real-world relationships, even when the culture is starting to push back on us and, and we're starting to believe that we really can have even better relationships with people a world away. I think these these custom-crafted communities we create for ourselves out there on the internet, I think they expose something in us. I think they expose that we can, make, we can make comfort into an idol. We can be very, very drawn to be comfortable. We hate it when people push us outside of our comfort zones. If we have it our way, we want to relate to people who are as easy as possible to relate to, right? And how do we do that? We find people who are as much like us as possible. And really, I think buried somewhere back deep in our hearts is this idea that if my church was just made up of 150 me's, it would be such a great church, right? 
How could I not get along? What a, what a great place it would be if everyone thought like I thought and did the things I did and valued the things I valued. That's, that's the way we tend to think. And so we go online and we make these communities. They're voluntary communities, right? You opt in to these communities and you build them around common interest. Well, the Lord has called us to be involuntary communities, right? We proclaim the gospel to everyone and the Lord brings whom he wills. And we are now challenged to have to find relationship, to find friendship with people who are so very different from us. And that makes the gospel look great. That makes the gospel look glorious. When I can get along with people that I have absolutely nothing else in common with, except that we are both loved by the Lord, and therefore we love one another. There's a concern in building communities that look just like us. We can't afford to bypass real-world relationships in favor of ones that are virtual. My concern is we're starting to disobey the Lord's command to go if we refuse to go to those who are right around us. So that's not to say we can't be a member of those communities. You don't have to cancel your Facebook account. You don't have to stop relating to people online. That, that truly is a good thing. But your main identity, who you really are, has got to be anchored here in the real world in space, in time. So go, go to your family first. Then go to your neighbors. Then go to your city, go to your neighborhood, go to your county, go to your country. Just, just go and make sure that's who you are and that's where you are before anything else. I was reading in Romans 10 this week where Paul quotes Isaiah, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach good news. It's kind of a weird thing to say, isn't it? Maybe one of those phrases as Christians we get a little used to, how beautiful are the feet why feet? It's kind of a weird thing to say, right? Beautiful feet, unless, unless it's the feet that represent the going, the feet that represent the obedience to that great commission, right? It's not how beautiful are the fingers that write good news. It's not how beautiful are the thumbs that are texting good news, right? It's how beautiful are the feet that are going and bringing that great news. So there's our first challenge in this world, the challenge to live and belong in this real world so we can go into this real world and take that gospel with us. So let me move then from that command to go to the command to share the gospel. And I want us to see as well that there's a challenge here for us, a challenge that comes in this digital world, in this digital era, and it's a challenge of living lives that are mediated so going, of course, is just the beginning. Going is not enough. We have to go and we have to preach the gospel, right? Once we've left, once we've gone, we now have to bring this message. We're to communicate the truth of the gospel. And we're to communicate it in effective ways so that the people will listen, so the people will heed it. We said that we're in this communications revolution, that there's this digital explosion. And by, what I mean by that is just this explosion of digital devices all around us, right? All these new phones, all these new gadgets that we have access to, they're all digital. And that gives us many, many new ways to communicate. So as we think about our, our mandate from the Lord is to go and communicate, we have all these new ways to communicate, then it should be easier than ever to carry out our commission, right? You just think about all these new technologies and how many of them are given simply to communicate, right? What is a cell phone for except a way to communicate? How about your computer and your iPad and email and Facebook and Twitter and ebooks and digital cameras? All of these things in one way or another are a means for us to communicate with one another. We're communicative beings. We just love to be constantly communicating and all these new devices allow us to do that. But something interesting is happening. As we communicate more in quantity, we find that we're actually communicating less in quality. And what we're doing is we're increasingly mediating ourselves so that more and more of our communication, instead of being face-to-face, -face, more and more of it is now through devices, right? So we have this media that stands between me and you as we communicate with one another. Just think about all the things that we used to do face-to-face -face that we now do online, Right? Go back a generation, and you think about going to the bank. You had to go to the bank, and you had to speak to somebody face-to-face, -face, right? You don't need to do that anymore in most cases. How about shopping? You used to have to go to a store, speak to somebody, look them in the eye as you shopped. Now you can go to Amazon, you can just fill out your order, and two days later there's a box outside your front door. 
Think about friendship, right? How much of friendship? It used to be face-to-face. You'd invite someone into your home, and now your friendship is carried out through Facebook, through whatever the media is. My wife has a very good friend who lives, we live in townhouses, and we, we have a row of townhouses that faces another row of townhouses with this grassy area in between. I could take a tennis ball and, and throw it out my, my living room window, and I could land it in my wife's friend, her name is Jen, I could land it in her living room, and yet they'll sit on their computers and talk to one another through Facebook. And I'll just say, why don't you just come over? Jen, just come over and sit in the living room and talk to her. But no, they prefer just to, to type messages back and forth. I don't understand it. Um, but it's a classic case of mediating friendship. Instead of being face-to-face, they're communicating through the computer. So many different things we used to do face-to-face. Church. A lot of people are now migrating online. As I said, their church experience is now mediated. How about sex? What is pornography? But, but allowing the computer, that, that media, to stand between you and your sexual partner, even evangelism. A lot of evangelism is now being attempted in a mediated way. You used to go to the street corner. You used to stop someone and say, hey, I'd like to tell you about Jesus Christ. Now you might go onto a forum or you might go onto a blog and, and try and share the gospel that way. We're finding that some things really can be done very well online. I don't need to look somebody in the eye in order to transfer money from the checking account to the savings account, right? There's no real benefit being face-to-face in that context. But there are certain things that really do, just as humans, we do them so much better, so much more naturally when we're actually face-to-face. What we're finding, again, is that we're communicating more in quantity but less in quality. And why is that? That's because as the voice extends, somehow the person recedes a little bit. So if you're sitting in this room today, you're having a very different experience of me being here than if you're out on the live stream and you're watching through your computer. Why? Because I'm here and you're here. And so we're present here together. Whereas if you're watching the live stream, you're not. As the voice extends, as it goes wider, as it goes to more people, the person recedes a little bit. There's less of me. Just as if we're sitting in a restaurant together, there's three of us at a table, then we're more fully present, right? You think about this. I've never heard of a young man who who looks his girlfriend in the eye and says, I just, I cannot wait until we're apart so I can write you a letter. That would be amazing, (laughs) right? That doesn't happen. But what he does is he writes her a letter and says, I just cannot wait to be with you. We long for that face-to-face communication, right? We long to be present. That's the great hope of the gospel, isn't it? That we will be face-to-face with Jesus Christ, our Savior. That we will recover everything we lost in the fall. There's something deep inside us that longs to be real with one another, that longs to be present together. One of our great challenges today, then, is pushing back against all of this mediated communication, against relying on it too heavily, And again, don't hear me wrong here. There's nothing intrinsically evil. There's nothing wrong with using Skype. I use Skype to communicate to my family down here. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing intrinsically evil about email. Well, maybe email. (laughs) All of these things can be used for good purposes. We admit that, right? We know that. They can all be used for good. Yet we need to ensure that we're still building those authentic face-to-face relationships, those relationships that can go so much deeper. Because this is where we'll have the best and most natural and most effective opportunities to share the message that the Lord has entrusted to us. And what we tend to do is we tend to think that this relationship I've made out here on the internet, that that person I speak to entirely through Facebook, that's that's simply replacing one good friendship with another good friendship. And yet we're not, that's not really the case. What you're doing is you're displacing. You're displacing a good friendship with one that is inherently less meaningful one that is inherently shallower. What you're really doing is you're trading down. As we begin to find identity and shared interests instead of shared geography, instead of uh, shared space, we're replacing those, those good, deep, meaningful friendships with ones that just aren't as deep. Why? Because when we're mediated, when we're a screen removed from one another, we're giving so much less of ourselves, right? It has to be that way. Where will you and I, where will we have the best and most natural opportunities to share the gospel? That will be where we have the deepest and most meaningful relationships, not just shared interests, but shared lives, 
shared walks, right? Jesus didn't just write a letter to his disciples and say, follow me by being my pen pal and I'll send you a letter every couple of weeks, right? He said, follow me, be with me, get the dust of my feet on you as you follow behind me here. He had to be with them in the real world so they could see who he really was, so he could see who they really were. So we need to, we need to learn to get offline. We need to learn to minimize that and relate to people here in the real world. I'll be speaking about that a little bit more in the breakout session later, about how that plays in family situations. I can find an illustration for this. A few years ago, 2003, there was a big power outage across uh, part of the eastern U.S. and um, all the way through Ontario. And for two days in some places, the power was just gone. And um, something interesting happened in a neighborhood in Toronto. People got home from work. They went into their homes and they tried the remote and nothing worked. And they tried turning on their computers and nothing worked. And nobody knew what to do, so they all went outside. And they started talking to people. And they started relating as people. And there's this one neighborhood in Toronto that actually said, from now on, every year, we're going to turn off our phones and turn off our computers and turn off our TVs on this date and just mark this as the day we actually met our neighbors and remembered we do have a neighborhood. This was a classic neighborhood where you, at the end of the day, you drive into your garage and you close the door behind you. You watch TV. You use the internet. At the end of the, you know, you, you sleep. Next morning, the garage door goes up and you're back to work. But that day, they all related because they had nothing else to do. All their entertainment was gone. All their digital devices were gone. Well, as Christians, I think we've got the opportunity to call people back to something maybe they don't even know they're missing, which is authentic, real, deep, meaningful relationships. And we can lead the way here. I think we as Christians have a call to lead the way here and and just being good neighbors and being good members of the same neighborhood. We can definitely have friendships through the internet. We can have real and meaningful friendships through the internet. I've got several people who are close friends, and we relate through email, through Facebook, through Skype, and that's, that's okay. These things aren't evil, but we need to understand that they are inherently, they're intrinsically limited because of the media. I can never be as close to that person as I can to the person in my own neighborhood. The gospel comes best, the, the gospel is accepted best. In, in that context, authentic relationship. And there's a simple fact we're dealing with. There's less authenticity when you're communicating online. You know, when we're online, the, the big thing is we, we only give as much of ourselves as we want to give, right? And so the me that I put out on Facebook, that's not the real me. That's me as I want you to believe I am, right? If you, if you look at everything I've said about myself on Facebook, then you go and talk to my wife and say, what he's, what, what's he really like? They're going to be very, very different pictures, right? Because that's the me I want you to know about. That's, that's me in this custom-crafted way. That, that's just me pridefully. That's me what I want to display. That's so different from inviting people into your home, inviting your unbelieving neighbors into your home where they can see you've got bad hair days. They can see your children misbehaving. They can see you misbehaving as you try and deal with your children misbehaving. And in all of that, they see that you're a real person, that you're a saint, but you're also a sinner. And they say, I can, I see that. I don't have to be perfect. I know I can't be perfect, but there's a man who loves the Lord, loves his family, sins and repents and finds forgiveness. That's inviting people into your world. We're now building, if we're building the majority of our relationship in a way that just can't be authentic, I think we're limiting our effectiveness as evangelists. We're limiting the way in which we can carry out that great commission. We're investing in relationships that have a much lower opportunity to share the gospel in an effective way. Well, our job is not complete when a person professes faith in Christ. Really, our job is just beginning at that point, right? So once we've gone into the world, and once we've shared the gospel and seen the Lord save his people, now now we have the task of discipling them, right? Right there in the Great Commission, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. That's not a one-day thing. You don't teach them to observe all that I've commanded you before they become believers. That's something you do once the Lord has saved them. And you know that... The New Testament is full of commands to grow from milk to meat, to grow from milk to solid food, to to just grow up, right? 
How many times does the New Testament tell us to grow up, to grow in our knowledge of the Lord? And once we grow in our knowledge of the Lord, we can grow in our obedience to the Lord. We can grow in our likeness to Jesus Christ. And of course, once we disciple these people, they too can go out. They too can go. They too can preach. And then they too can disciple. One of the big challenges in a digital world that I see is we, as we think about discipleship in a digital world, I think of the, the area of distraction. I think that we live in a world now that is very, very distracting. There are just so many new ways that this world distracts us. When I began writing a book on technology, this was the number one question in my mind. And when I told other people I was writing a book on technology, this is what they would ask me. They would say, why can't I think anymore? I used to be able to think. I just feel like I don't think deeply anymore. Well, what's happened? I'm sure somehow they thought technology was to blame. They thought that technology had something to do with it, but they couldn't quite place it. What I found it was actually worse than that. It's not just that we're thinking shallow thoughts these days, but it's also that we're starting to live shallow lives on the basis of thinking shallow thoughts. So our digital devices, your phone, your iPad, your computer, your, all these different things we use, they're evolving toward distraction. With every generation, they find new and creative ways to distract us, to alert us. Just think about it. 20 years ago, when you left your home, you were cut off, right? There was nothing in your car. Very few people had a phone back then. Certainly when you're outside of your car, nobody had a phone. 20 years ago, even if you did have a phone, well, it didn't have games and text messages and Facebook and a whole world of blogs and social media on it. Our distraction is causing us now to think shallow thoughts. And why is that? Well, there's there's an active way in which our devices are doing that. They're always ringing. They're always beeping. They don't care what we're doing. They just want us to pay attention to them, right? Think of a truck that's backing up. You know, beep, beep. It makes that beeping noise. That truck doesn't care what you're doing, right? It just wants you to know that whatever you're doing is less important than getting out of the way of that truck, right? And so it's beeping at you to say, whatever you're doing, Pay attention and stop doing it, or you're going to start hurting really soon. Okay? And, and, and our devices are the same way. They don't care what we're doing. They don't care if we're awake or asleep. Last night, uh, the guy I'm rooming with, his phone went bling at about 3 in the morning because I don't know what happened, but it didn't care that we were asleep. It just made a noise. And um, our, our devices are always distracting us from what we're doing. They, they're totally uncaring and insensitive. They just want to alert us, you need to pay attention to me right now. So they actively work against us. They also passively worked against us in that they, order, they, they offer us at all times just a world of entertainment, a world of things to do. Our minds never shut off. You know that, right? Our minds are always going. You can't turn your brain off. That's impossible to do. They're always thinking about something. Now, it used to be a long time ago, if you had nothing to distract you, then you would chew over ideas. You would use those down times to think. To, to ponder things, to meditate on something. But now in those down times, we've always got something to distract us. We always have something to keep us from that hard work of thinking, that seemingly thankless, boring work of just thinking, of just letting our minds chew things over. So what we do is we fill every moment with entertainment. We fill every moment with input. And so this morning, if you're in that 18 to 35-year age range, One-third of you checked your phone before you even got up in the morning, before you even got out of bed in the morning, before you even went to the bathroom in the morning, you checked your phone. Half of you uh, did that before you you got dressed this morning. So half the people in this room, half the young women in this room, they checked in on Facebook before they started their day. Well, there's just a couple moments of what could have been downtime. Your mind's going to be going somewhere. It will be doing something. You chose just to fill it with that. At a red light, I can... I'll admit this, at a red light, I have to battle not to grab my phone and check my email. Like that 35-second window there seems like, what am I going to do? So I, I, I find myself reaching for my phone just to fill that time with something. And what we're finding is our distraction keeps us from thinking deep thoughts. And when we don't think deep thoughts, we can't live deep and meaningful lives. We, we live in a shallow way. And I've been so inspired by Solomon, who... Um, Solomon was a busy man, wasn't he? He was a king. He had lots to do. I'm sure he didn't have a lot of spare time in his life. And yet he would write Proverbs like the one where he's, uh, he's walking by a vineyard. 
and he sees that the walls are broken down, and he sees that everything's being overgrown, things are not in good shape. And what does he do? He says, then I saw and considered it. I looked and received instruction, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you like a robber and want like an armed man. So what did Solomon do? He had to stop. He had to look at that thing. He had to consider it. He had to ponder it. He had to spend a few moments just thinking about it. And the Lord taught him something through that, right? He received this message. He received this understanding, this lesson, that if you're lazy, your, la- your laziness escalates, and eventually it leads to this. This didn't happen in a day. This wasn't a one-day thing. It was just a little sleep, sleeping in one day. It was just being a little lazy that day. And it grew into this, the complete waste of something that was precious, family land. Well, how would that happen today? You're walking by the field of a slug- uh, sluggard, by the vineyard of a man lacking sense, but you didn't see it because you had your head down, you were writing a text message on your phone. Or maybe you did see it, and it was all overgrown with thorns and thistles, and you, you stopped, and you pondered, and your phone went bing. And so you check your text messages, and all right, this time, you look, and ping, it pings again, so you take an Instagram, and maybe you look at it later or something, I don't know. <laughs> but that, this is the world we live in, where we just, our, our devices are constantly calling us out of what we're doing and towards something else. It's a world of distraction, and that's just a silly example. But how many of us bought a phone to, I need to have a phone with me so I'll be safe when I travel? But before you know it, you're checking Facebook all the time. Or, I'm going to buy an iPad and use it to read books. Oh, I'll be able to get access to all these amazing cheap Kindle books. But soon you're playing games. You're playing, I don't know what, Farmville. Whatever it is that's that's dominating these things. You You think of biblical meditation. Psalm 1. I studied Psalm 1 last week. Blessed is the man whose delight is in the law of God. And what does a person do when he delights in the law of God? He meditates on it day and night. Well, how could we meditate on God's word day and night when we always have something distracting us? We always have something better, flashier, more exciting than meditating on the word of God. And so we take that thing out and we're drawn to it time and time again. We think shallow thoughts. We have to then live shallow lives. How will we ever get the the, the truths of God's word deep down inside if we don't focus on them? How can God transform us if we're not meditating on his word? What is really our delight if we're filling all those small moments with distraction, with games, with communicating? If you've been a Christian for a long time, you know that godliness, you know that sanctification, you know putting sin to death, that is hard, hard work. That is a long, long labor. It takes committed work. It takes dedicated effort. This life is a battle. And now today we're being constantly drawn out of, these, out of this battle. If we can only ever think shallow thoughts, if we'll only ever live shallow lives, and if we ever live, only ever live shallow lives, then how can I disciple somebody, right? Here's the part of the, the commission. Go and disciple them. How can I disciple people if my life is one of distraction? If what they're learning from me is that a red light is a good opportunity to check your email, They're learning that the best use of an iPad is to check Facebook at all times and all places. If they're learning that I don't have time to meditate on God's word, what would I really have to teach somebody? How can I disciple somebody if I'm living a shallow life? So here's the world we live in. This new world, the world after this digital explosion that's gone on around us. It brings us amazing new capabilities. Make no mistake, there are amazing things here, things we would never have imagined that we'd have. And you think back 20 years, and if you described an iPhone to me, I would have laughed at you and told you that would never exist. And I mean, this is the world we're in. It's an amazing thing. But mixed with all those opportunities are very real and very specific temptations, very specific ways we can use God's good gifts in very bad, very bad ways. That that ability to craft an identity for ourselves from whatever way we want, unhinged from geography, unhinged from our local context, that that can keep us from obeying God's command to go into all this world. Our obsession with mediating ourselves, mediated communication, that may keep us from forming the kinds of relationships that gives us those natural, effective opportunities to share God's word. And then all that distraction we allow into our lives, it keeps us 
shallow thinkers, which keeps us shallow livers, which means I have nothing to tell you. When I want to disciple you, I really have so, so little to offer you. So maybe here's a text, text from Scripture we need to claim here in this digital age. All things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. God does not forbid us these things, but maybe they're not that helpful. Maybe they're not that helpful in every context. I believe God loves technology. I believe we honor God when we create and when we use technology. That will be part of the subject of the breakout I do later. But I believe that Satan loves it too. These things can serve us. These amazing new things can serve us as we fulfill the the mission of the church, as we protect the message of the church, as we declare the message of the church. Or, Or they can hinder us. And you and I, we're making that decision day by day, week by week. Whatever you eat, whatever you drink, whatever you text, whatever you tweet, whatever, whether you Facebook or Netflix, whatever it is, whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Amen? Amen. Let me pray for us. Our Father, we do thank you for the ways you've blessed us in this world. Uh, you really have given us such great gifts and such great comforts, and we want to use those things in an effective way, in a way that honors and glorifies you. So we pray that you would give us that wisdom and give us that discernment that we could use these things well, that we could use these things wisely, that we could glorify you through them, that they would help us, not hinder us, as we seek to carry out the commission you've given us. Won't you help us, us here, to lead the way, help us to be faithful stewards of these good gifts we pray in Christ's name. Amen.